I V M. Hello and welcome to the Habit Coach Podcast. I am Ashton Doctor, your Habit Coach, and today I have a very special episode. With me in the studio is Dylan Smith, the founder of Vital Veda, all the way from Australia. And Dylan is an Ayurvedic practitioner, and we just met yesterday, and I found it fascinating his approach to Ayurveda, which is where he talks about the modern science and Ayurveda and how they work beautifully. Dylan, welcome. Thank you so much. So, Dylan, I wanted to start off by asking you, how did you get into Ayurveda in Australia? Ayurveda, how was that? Um, I was actually I came to India for okay. a trip, and I visited this clinic called the Raju Clinic in Hyderabad, and I just saw how powerful it was. And uh, saw the miraculous healings occurring, and at that time I learned about the notion of dharma, about mm -hmm. your most evolutionary thing you can do. And I said, okay, I don't want to be studying architecture anymore, which I were, and I want to study Ayurveda. So I just started simple. So from architecture to Ayurveda. Mm. So what was the thought of dharma that that led you to this? Uh, I this just part? learned about dharma, and I, and I and I knew I didn't want to do architecture. I wasn't loving it, mm -hmm. and then I learned about dharma, and mm -hmm. I just said, okay. Hmm. Well, and it taught me, couple your a talent that you have mm -hmm. and how you can serve the world, mm -hmm. and then execute that. So it's just like, okay, I'm definitely, I want to live a dharma. So I'm not going to continue architecture because it's not the most evolutionary thing I could be doing mm -hmm. in terms of helping people. And, yeah, and serving that people. It just yeah. I didn't love it. It wasn't flowing. So, but what was it about Ayurveda that made you so attracted to it? I wasn't even very attracted. Actually, mm -hmm. it was more my teachers just said. I told my teacher about this conflict I was having within myself with, right. you know, architecture, wasn't loving it. And they, all they said was, come study Ayurveda with us. Mm. And I said, okay. I didn't even think about it. I just did it. <laughs> and like, so I wasn't even that drawn to it. And then I just started and started spending more time with them and going there every year. Mm -hmm. And they're one of the few families in the world who have the pure authentic knowledge that have, have it for generations. Mm -hmm. And um, I just the more I got into it, the more they our relationship grew every year and mm -hmm deeper we got so it just yeah it was all all from there and is there a certain perspective of ayurveda that you have because you're not coming from an you know you're not staying in india and having mm. the baggage that comes with it you're abroad and you're in australia what is it like being an ayurvedic practitioner there well the veda is very universal you know it's not necessarily indian so okay. it's such a foundational body of knowledge which is applicable to the whole universe so mm -hmm. And I just feel the reason I resonate with it so much, I guess, is because it's natural law. You know, mm. the Veda is natural law. It's the foundations. You know, I was, I'm Jewish blood. Mm. You know, I've grown up in a Jewish community in mm -hmm. Australia. But the Veda and also with my friends who are into the Veda, mm. it's because it's just so innate, so yeah. natural. It's such, it's science. It's the laws of nature. So that just resonates with me and resonates with people who are into it. And when you, when it gets down to it, it's it's that fundamental teaching and body of knowledge which is so relevant hmm. to everywhere in the world. In fact, what resonated with me from yesterday's talk was how modern science and Ayurveda are now mixing and matching. Hmm. You know, when we talk to Ayurvedic practitioners here in India, it's always, no, no, Ayurveda is Ayurveda. They don't, never think about actually bringing in the science that's happening, hmm. which is what I like and I find fascinating. And ever since I started re researching a little bit more about Ayurveda, I found that there were so many connections. Hmm. What are some of the aspects that you find most interesting with what's happening now in the modern world and Ayurveda? Mm. Yeah, well, I mean, slowly modern science is proving the ancient wisdom of Ayurveda. And this is this is exciting for us to see. And it's nice. It's, it clarifies for people like you and many Westerners and young people who want the modern science as a mm. clarification. It somewhat does it justice, but, you know, still it's very hard for studies and modern uh, clinical trials to be able to prove such hmm. vast body of knowledge it can and it does prove it and it's nice to prove it um, but you know the main aspect is uh, one of the fine examples is the 2017 Nobel Prize was won for circadian medicine mm -hmm. which is living in tune with nature cycles living in tune with the circadian rhythms right. and that was you know, at, when that was one that had the Ayurvedic community laughing and, and but also provided well overdue relief and what it was saying was we are now facing so many chronic disease epidemics mm -hmm. you know cancer is one in two men will get cancer in their life. Right. One in three females will get cancer in their life. We have dementia, Alzheimer's, autoimmune disorders, diabetes, the list goes on, and infertility, eye issues. And modern science has saying, and what the Nobel Prize was won for is to prevent these, you need to sleep with the sun, wake with the sun, eat with the sun, 
you know, honor your circadian rhythms. Saying that simple, we've we've been so out of touch with our nature Mm -hmm. that this is the prescription to deal with these modern disease epidemics, chronic disease epidemics, and Ayurveda has the tools for that. Because Are there certain about, rules that you can follow for the circadian rhythm, for example? Yeah, well, the simple thing is the sun, you mm-hmm. know, like that's the main governor of the day. Okay. So you should be waking up with the sun mm-hmm. and going to sleep not long after the sun. And after the sun mm-hmm. sets, is meant to be dark. So you should not be exposed to a lot of bright lights, artificial lights, blue light. Rather, uh, if you're going to have lights on, which of course we are, right. you should have more incandescent, yellow, warmer lights, candles, things like that, reduce the screens. Mm -hmm. And this is regulating your light cycles, your eye cycles, um, your melatonin, your, you know, the light which is hitting the eye is telling your brain what time it is. And if you're right now, we're in a bright room, which is, you know, happens. We think it's daylight, right? Exactly. We think it's midday because the light temperature now is the light temperature of a midday sun. So our brain thinks it's midday and then we go to sleep in two hours and it's confused and it doesn't get the proper sleep, mm-hmm. things like this. So the sun is a simple circadian rhythm to follow. And then waking up with the sun, you know, the morning sun has so many beneficial uh, rays and so many beneficial frequencies it emits, like the ultraviolet is only available in the morning. Okay. And that is what stimulates the thyroid hormones, so many processes in the body. So getting all the sun is, is important. Getting the sun early in the morning, mm. up till what, what time? Uh, up till Within the first one, two hours the first of one, sunrise is, is giving vital frequencies and that UV, yeah. ultraviolet, mm-hmm. which we won't get later. And that is what's going to stimulate certain hormones. And and you need to stand and bask in the sun or do you just need to look out both. at the... You need so both, we need to have the, we need to see it mm-hmm. and be in the daylight. Mm-hmm. And we also get our skin in as much as possible. Okay. They both do different things. Even our skin has photoreceptors, which, you know, also tell what time it is and stimulate the hormones right. um, it's called melanopsin it's in the skin and Correct. that's why blind people can know when it's dark or night yep. so it's very influential the skin as well mm-hmm. as the body clocks and Ayurveda has these principles about the skin and, and the light into mm. it right fantastic yeah it's, it's, it's the first thing Ayurveda says with the daily routine is mm. get up before the sun get up before the sun I think that's a very good rule to, for us to live by right? and okay. if you look at the Ayurveda science of it mm-hmm. Before the sunrise is the air and space element we mm-hmm. call the vata. Mm-hmm. If you wake up with that, you were with air and space for the whole day. Air and space means creativity, clarity. But if you sleep in mm-hmm. and go past sunrise mm-hmm. is the kapha, the heaviness, the earth element. If you stay with that, then that will stick with you for the day. And you stay drowsy. Yeah. yeah. And those who know, you sleep in, mm-hmm. you feel more drowsy. Yeah. Even though you're in the bed for longer, you'll feel more sluggish. But if you wake up with the vata, with the air and space element, where the creativity and clarity is dominant, mm-hmm. then you feel that the whole day. I find all this so fascinating. Mm. And um, like we were discussing, another aspect that I see as a big commonality is with the way Ayurveda approaches food. Mm. Um, Are you seeing a lot of new research coming about with the way that uh, Ayurveda and the current science are talking to each other? The main thing with with the Ayurveda food component compared to the rest of the Mm -hmm. is there's so many diet fads and nutrition coming out now. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the science is updating or they're saying, oh, actually, we were wrong. We're going to change our mind. Mm-hmm. The thing with Ayurveda is it has been kept the same thing for thousands of years. It doesn't update its additions. It Correct. doesn't. So, but it's very simple. It's principles. You know, people are getting very caught up about diets. Oh, I'll have this fruit, that vegetable, this superfood, that grain, that yeah, nut. Yeah. Forget it. Just eat simply in season because whatever nature is providing in that season mm-hmm. is what you need. And even along with this circadian medicine, they mm-hmm. were also showing the importance of seasonal foods, Correct. of eating locally because that actually creates the microbiome which mm-hmm. you need. So we know we are mostly bugs and mm-hmm. bugs are, of course, in all living things like food and plants and vegetables. So the vegetables create and the soil as well creates the exact microbiome that we need mm-hmm. for that season. Like we have microbes which digest wheat. Right. And that's produced at a certain time of the year, mm. more in the winter. Mm-hmm. It's called amylase protein. Correct. That's produced in wheat. Mm. I mean, produced in us yeah. to digest wheat, but yeah. only in winter. Right. And that's when... Wheat should naturally be eaten. Fascinating. So it's mainly the simple principles of eat seasonally, mm-hmm. eat you know cooked food, mm-hmm. eat fresh food, mm-hmm. avoid the processed stuff. And Ayurveda is very strong on this cooked food mm-hmm. as a thought, right? Even if it's something, you just have to blanch it for a few seconds, exactly. but it has to pass through that. Is there any particular reason for that? It's because why make our digestive fire, which we call Agni, right. why make our Agni do the cooking? Uh-huh. Let the external, let the kitchen do the cooking. Let the kitchen do the hard work. Then mm. less work for our 
digestive fire, especially today when so many people have low digestive digestive strength and digestive fire right. and irregular digestion and poor digestive capacity. If you're putting on a big raw food diet or a big green smoothie, mm-hmm. which is, it's so hard to digest. Why give okay. so much strain? Let the kitchen cook it. Then there's less cooking for us to do. Hmm. Simple. Peace around your food. Yeah. Yeah. A very important principle. And that's, that's an important one is how you eat. A lot of people are like, what do you eat? They become obsessed, but mm. you need to eat in a relaxed manner. I don't care if you're eating the best organic Ayurvedic food. If you're eating it on the run, at the desk, in the bus, on the train, yeah. just stop. Make eating like a ritual. Turn on the parasympathetic nervous system, mm-hmm. the rest and digest nervous system. Mm-hmm. Then you will digest it and that will give you energy and nutrients. If you're eating the best organic food, but it's on the run, your flight or fight activated your sympathetic nervous system. You can't digest even the best food then. So it's how you eat. I love this. Mm. It's such a good tip because all we do is eat in a hurry mm. or eat in front totally. of the TV. We never spend time actually seeing or being with the food that we're eating. This is a beautiful tip. I heard a crazy st- statistic yesterday. Mm-hmm. 70% of Americans eat in their car. Oh my God. Yeah. So that's why the drive throughs and... drive throughs or just yeah. on the way to work. Yeah, it's crazy. Not How can you focus on what you're doing? Can't. Just today I was giving a talk to somebody and I was telling them that it's so important for us to realize that whatever we put in our mouth at some point becomes our body. And the way we treat it is also important. Right, So like at the end of this, the whole nutritional journey, there's a spiritual aspect to it as well, a spiritual aspect of food. Mm. And that's so much, that's so important for us to slowly move towards and understand. Yes, yeah. totally. Um, I wanted to ask you a question. What are your favorite habits that mm. are non-negotiable? Things that you will definitely do every day. Okay, the number one non-negotiable priority is mm. meditating. Okay. Twice a day, 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes in the evening. You know, we sleep, we go to the toilet, we eat food. You also have to de-excite your mind and bring it to a state of calm and transcend the senses mm-hmm. and transcend your relative daily you know, actions and go to a state of being. Correct. And that state of absolute pure consciousness where everything comes from. Mm-hmm. Transcend the relative and go to that twice a day. Bathe in it twice a day. And the benefits of being in that state, of dipping into that right. and then coming back to activity twice a day is profound and it provides studies have shown when you do the right meditation which makes you transcend mm-hmm. it's two to five times deeper sleep than deeper rest than sleep and uh, found healing can occur mm-hmm. that's absolutely non-negotiable and um, is there any particular form of meditation that you like yeah. doing i practice one called vedic meditation okay it's the same as transcendental meditation same okay. technique mm-hmm. so that's just uh using a mantra which a teacher will give to you and that makes you transcend the relative so you need a teacher to take you through this you journey. need a teacher to initiate you give you a, a personal mantra for you and just give you the technique okay then you've got it self-sustainable you own it and then you just do it for the rest, the of, rest your of your life yeah. fantastic okay so that's one non-negotiable habit what, what are some of the others another one for me is doing a self massage every day self oil massage which we call abhyanga what fun right yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what fun and what respect and what feel good mm-hmm. <laughs> i mean like you know we bathe ourselves every day we mm-hmm. also have to anoint our body with oil mm-hmm. and move the blood move the lymph you know, in India, actually, it's it's quite a common practice, more than the West, but yes. especially for the babies. Um, but yeah, it should be done. It, we have microbes on our skin, a very strong colony of microbiology, and they love oil. So it's feeding the microbiology. It's pacifying the nervous system. Our skin has more nerve endings than anything. Hmm. And it moves the blood and moves the lymph. So for me, that's just essential. It's it's like my bath. You know, my bath is also essential. That's right. one of them, and that's part of the daily routine. Right. Um, you know, just a, a cold shower. Or in Australia, I swim every day in the ocean. Mm-hmm. But before that, part of that, very linked to that, is putting oil on my body and giving myself a massage before that. And does the oil matter? Is it an? Imp- it should be a coconut in the summer. Okay. Or sesame oil in the winter. Okay. Or if you can get a medicated Ayurvedic oil, mm. which is very easy to get at a local Ayurvedic pharmacy in India. Mm-hmm. Or you can get from me, I, I stock medicated oils specifically made by my teachers and myself. Okay. Like that is the best. Those are the best oils too. If you can get medicated, yeah. yeah. You may as well, you're doing a massage. Get that. And you were telling me you have a massage video on, on your yeah. website. Can you share your website yeah. details? With it's you? actually, at the moment, there's only a poster. Okay. So if you go to vitalveda.com.au mm-hmm. and it's on the homepage, if not, you just type in self-massage and you can download a free poster and it teaches you how to do it. How to do the Abhyangar massage. Right? Yes, you just stick it, you know, Print it and mm-hmm. just watch it while you learn and you'll take a few days to learn. You'll know how to do it. Fantastic. What are some of the other habits people can use for their daily life that mm. help them with, you know, the current stresses of modern life that, mm. that exist? 
I'll give you another oil okay. oil technique. Is oh. sniffing oil up your nose. Sniffing oil. Yeah. All right. We call it nasya, mm -hmm. and uh, you can use either cold pressed sesame oil, mm -hmm. or you can buy an oil called anu tailam. Okay. Very common in any Ayurvedic pharmacy. Anu a n u tailam. Uh. Okay. Or you can buy from me if you're in Australia mm -hmm. or get it shipped. I stock a specific medicated oil as well, mm -hmm. and it just is a process of popping a couple drops of oil into each nostril. Okay. And Sniffing it up your nose and breathing out the mouth, <laughs> and that's that's great. It's a practice we should be doing daily, and and sniffing medicated oil up the nose. It's feeding the brain with mm -hmm. oil. It's activating our pituitary gland, our mm -hmm. penile gland, which you know we call the third eye. Um, it's strengthening all the sensory organs, and it's lubricating the brain. And right okay. now we're in an epidemic of dry brains because we're in an office mm -hmm. where you know talking on the phones, where seeing these bright lights drying out the brain through the eyes and this is why the dementia and Alzheimer's are very much on the rise so doing this every day um, it's so easy you have it on your desk pop it in whenever it up, put it in. Um, do it before exercise have it on you mm -hmm. just the more the better and you can feel an immediate response from, from the oil. Mm. Like, What are the tangible benefits that you would feel immediately? It activates your brain so it will help you whether you're studying or mm -hmm. working and you just feel nourished. Mm. It's just it's that the oil has this beautiful nourishing quality and it's, it's comforting the brain. Mm. And mainly it's the prevention, preventative tool and it will you strengthen your sinuses. So for those who, you know, if you're living in an India mm -hmm. city, mm -hmm. this will protect you from the pollution and, and protect your sinus cavities so that you're not getting the non-beneficial bacteria and uh, protects you from pollen. In people with sinus issues, with allergies, it will strengthen that, those cavities. Mm. Fascinating. Does um, Ayurveda actually speak about the microbiome in its texts or does it refer to it in any way or is it something that we infer saying that this is what people meant at that point of time? Mm. It's a good question. They definitely knew something like that. Mm -hmm. I haven't really come across any specific notions like that, but there's definitely links. I'd have to look and make those connections. Right. But, um, you know, we, we know, for example, ghee. Right. Okay. Ghee is the highest source of butric acid in the world. Mm -hmm. And butric acid is where the word butter comes from. Right. And we have bugs in our gut called Clostridium butricum. Mm. And they make this butric acid, mm. right? Mm -hmm. So ghee is the highest source of this. So when we give our gut bugs ghee, they're like, thank you so much. We make this. <laughs> like you're giving us what we make. And these are like very important bugs. Right. So like how did Ayurveda know that ghee supports your microbes so much? Correct. The other thing is, in Ayurveda, we have what we call sattvic lifestyle, okay. which means like living a pure lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And that is what enhanced microbiomes. Mm -hmm. You know, when we, it's interesting, an idea to explore is when you look at, say, someone who's very spiritually comfortable and in a high state of consciousness mm -hmm. and very happy, mm -hmm. you look at their microbe, because we're 90% microbiology, we're 90% right. bugs. So if you look at that person, I bet you they have a very beneficial microbes. Mm. It's really the microbes which are shaping the person. So if your microbes are happy, mm -hmm. the end result is happy. So if you have a nice, pure, loving person, their microbes will be nice, pure, loving. loving but if you have the other two body types, right. which we call, or more emotional types, mm -hmm. the rajas, which is like the stimulating person, mm -hmm. very agitated, fiery, maybe likes alcohol, coffee, stimulus. Mm -hmm. Their bugs will not be so calm and calm. pure and loving. Mm -hmm. It will be more on fire right. and inflammatory responses. Then you have the tamas, which is the inertia people, the more down people, the dark people, prone to depression. And they will have very degrading bugs mm -hmm. that are taking over and degrading the body. Mm. So this is one connection which we could look at. But um, yeah. And we float through these different doshas, right? They're, they're mm. called doshas through the seasons uh, and the changes through the yeah. years. Yeah, I mean, the doshas are just summaries of the five elements, the right. Panchamahabhutas, space, air, fire, water, earth. Mm. So okay. then the doshas, Vada, Pitta, Kapha. Vada is space and air. Mm -hmm. Pitta is fire and water. Mm -hmm. Kapha is earth and water. Okay. So these three doshas are just summaries of those five elements. Ayurveda is so simple. It said five doshas, then it made it even more simple. It said, There's let's three. make it to three. Right. And... Uh, this is just a way to balance and look at everything in nature. Everything in nature is the five elements. Hmm. Every plant, every human, every object. So it's about balancing these and that's a mechanism. But, but no need to get very rigid about it, as you said, because it changes. Right. Changes with the season, changes with what is going on in your life. Maybe you just moved from somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, so it's about just uh, adjusting to the, what you currently are.
Mm. Not trying to think too much. Just be with the season. That's the simple thing. Jet lag would cause a tremendous amount of havoc on this, right? On your circadian totally. rhythm and, and everything. Massive. I mean, flying is such a harsh um, activity. Right. It's, it's drier than the Sahara Desert. It's a... Uh, you know, you're completely changing your environment. So that's why the most important thing for flying mm. is to balance the vata, which is the air and space element, because mm. obviously the air and space is heavily increased. Correct. Because you're traveling through air and space and you're moving, and vata is movement. Mm-hmm. So you need to lubricate. And mm. nasya, the nose drops, mm-hmm. are the most important thing ever to do on a flight. Up your nose, and you can also do it in your ears. Okay. That will lubricate your brain from mm. the dryness and the microwave radiation that is like, it's, an airplane is like a microwave. Right. It's one of the harshest electromagnetic field environments. And also, when you land in your country of mm. destination, mm. get out in the sun, mm. and that will acclimatize you to where you are. Mm. And then eat the natural local seasonal foods that will also trigger in your body to know the environment that it is in. Then that will get rid of the jet lag. And meditate on the plane as much as you can. Meditate as much, instead of binge-watching TV and... And what you would typically do on a, yeah. on a flight. And do yoga asanas, walk around the plane. It's very fun. Okay, okay. People people watch you and then they like, they feel in themselves and they're like, oh, I really should be doing this. And then they <laughs> do it. Like I do yoga asanas for an hour. I find like an exit row and do it. It's just what, like down dog and stuff. Yeah. In, in the light. Different, different stuff that I can yeah. do. It depends on the space. Or if it's a Mus- like a Muslim plane, I take the Muslim prayer area. Oh, right. Kazaka and do yeah. my asanas. It's great. <laughs> What fun. Yeah, right. Is. Lovely. We've spoken about so much. Is there anything that you'd like to leave the listeners with as a thought for their life and what's something that they can follow? Um, wow. I guess the main thing is to not be too rigid on your health and mm-hmm. don't think of diseases so much. Just focus on your health. And the main thing is being established with your true state of being and your true nature. I mean, Ayurveda is about aligning with your true nature. Mm. That's where perfect health lies. So do what you need to do to tap into that and be more familiar with that. Mm. And don't know it as an intellectual idea. Mm. I am the universe. I am nature. Actually experience it. Mm -hmm. And what's the best way to experience it? Okay, meditation. Do the self abhyanga. Live with the circadian rhythms. Then you begin to actually experience it and feel it. Then once you're established in that place, you can radiate for all to enjoy Share your knowledge, share your love, share your service, whatever you have to do. So become more familiar with your inner state of being. That's mm. probably the most important thing. I love it. Heavy, very hard for people to get into the practice of doing. Yeah. It's just, you know, you, you'll find your own path and what's the best thing for you and do these things, these print activities because you enjoy them, you know, not because I'm telling you to do it. Correct. Do it, experience it, you experience the benefits, then you continue. Superb. Thank you so much for joining me. Where can people find out more about you, follow you? What are your handles? Okay, well, I'll start because these are obviously podcast listeners. Right. So I've got a podcast channel called The Vital Veda Podcast. The Vital Veda Podcast, yes, right. Yes, mainly me interviewing experts in the field of health, spirituality, relationships. And um, Instagram is where I post the most knowledge, Vital Veda on Instagram. And check out my website, vitalveda.com.au. Sign up to my newsletter. That's the main channels. Guys, his podcast is fantastic. I was just listening to him talking to an expert on water. And it was such an enlightening discussion. Thank you so much for joining me in the studio today. Thank you so much for having me. Think fast. If I tell you I'm Parsi, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Dansak, I don't blame you. My name is Perzan Patel. You may know me as the Bavi Bride. Though I run a popular Parsi food blog, the truth is I didn't know anything about Parsi food until I got married. It was just my luck. He turned out to be your typical Sadra Lega wearing, Kawab Khari eating Parsi boy. And the only thing I knew was Dansak, or rather how to eat it. But there's more to Parsi food than Dansak. And there is more to us than our obsession with eggs and our legendary Rani cafes. Welcome to Not Just Dansak, a fresh new show where I talk to friends, fellow Bavas and Parsi entrepreneurs about all things Bonu. A little bit of history, a dash of Bava madness and a lot of food talk. There's more to Parsis than meets the eye and there's certainly more to us than Dansak. Join me every Tuesday as I talk to some of my favorite Parsis in the food space in India and beyond. I am the Bavi Bride and this is not just Danza. Hi, my name is Anupam Gupta. I'm B50 on Twitter. I am the host of Pesa Pesa, the show that talks money. 
On my show, I speak to experts from every field of money and finance, from stock markets, equities, debt funds, credit cards, life insurance, every possible area of money and finance that you can think of. We even did an episode on cryptocurrency. I've got fantastic guests from mutual funds to personal finance experts everywhere. Robo advisory, startups, just name it, we've got it. At Pesa Pesa, we help you make smart decisions about money. You work hard for money. Now make your money work hard for you. New episodes out every Monday and you can listen to my show on the IVM podcast app or any other podcasting app that you have.